This dicebreaker video is sponsored by Wild Bills. Ditch the manufactured flavors. Your taste buds deserve better. Treat yourself to Wild Bills premium handcrafted soda pop. Mouthwatering beverages that allow you to escape to the most interesting places imaginable. Cheers to refusing the drink from the mainstream. Cheers to kick-ass canned. Cheers to being veteran owned and operated. At Wild Bills, flavor isn't everything. It's the only thing. Use discount code CHEERS15 for 15% off your first order. Being a tabletop RPG fan in the English-speaking corner of the world can be a little bit exhausting if you aren't super into Dungeons and & Dragons. It's the most prevalent game in the market by an indescribably large margin, dominating almost every aspect of the hobby. There might be a small section of indie RPGs in your local game store, but they'll be dwarfed by an entire shelf of players' handbooks, monster manuals and source books with that familiar red and black spine and bold white text. If you try and explain to a friend that you're playing a TTRPG tonight, it's likely that you'll have to use something in the lines of, you know, like Dungeons and Dragons in your explanation if they're not already clued in on TTRPGs. Like Hoovers for vacuum cleaners in the UK or Kleenex for tissues in the US, the words TTRPG and Dungeons and Dragons have become almost synonymous with each other. And the same is largely true for a lot of the world. Corporate overlords Wizard of the Coast and their even more corporate overlords at Hasbro are absurdly large fish in the TTRPG pond, and it can be difficult to escape their shadow in any regions of the world where their products are sold. But there's at least one country in the world that marches to the beat of its own drum. Japan is a nation that Western English-speaking countries have an interesting relationship and history with. There's no end of cultural exports that go both ways between these two separate but similar worlds, with Japanese video games, manga, anime and board games having a long-standing tradition and history of English localizations that perform massively well over in places like the UK and the US. Dragon Ball Z, Final Fantasy, Pokemon, it's not hard to find Japanese properties that have had an enormous impact on people the world over. That cultural relationship is pretty reciprocal though, with a lot of quote unquote Western culture reaching the other side of the world and firmly placing its roots to the point where it's quite common for a Japanese family to eat KFC for Christmas dinner. That's a real thing, Google it. But you know all this, Japanese media is the most accessible in the English speaking world it's ever been and vice versa. The logical conclusion would then be that Dungeons and Dragons with the weight and importance that it has in the West would have a similar success in Japan, dominating the market and the shelves of every game store from Kumamoto to Sapporo. The truth is though, whilst D&D is still popular in Japan, there's one game that stands head and shoulders above the rest of the titles in stores and online, and it's not even similar to the Western fantasy household name that we all know and tolerate. The most popular Western TTRPG in Japan is in fact Chaosium's Lovecraft-inspired, mythos-investigating, madness and horror-filled Call of Cthulhu. For those not in the know, Call of Cthulhu is an homage to the works of notorious cosmic horror author H.P. Lovecraft. Set in a rain-soaked Prohibition-era America from the start, but adaptable to other settings with source books like Cthulhu by Gaslight, which tracks it back to the 1800s for example, Call of Cthulhu deals with the unknowable eldritch beasts that wait beyond the edge of the universe, and the creeping horror and mental decay that knowledge of their existence can bring. It's a far cry from the swords and sorcery that dominates most role-playing games both on the tabletop and in the video game world. Call of Cthulhu also swaps the standard fare of dungeon crawling and monster slaying for a far more dangerous world where your characters are fragile at the whims of beings far beyond their comprehension. You don't spend your time equipping epic loot and completing legendary quests, but desperately surviving and investigating the creeping darkness. In Japan, Call of Cthulhu is the go-to Western RPG. It was first translated into Japanese by publisher Hobby Japan, which localized the game's third edition in 1986. Following a break in development during the 1990s due to a slump in the local market, its sixth edition was released by current publisher Kadokawa in 2004 and has seen a number of reprints since. By September 2019, all versions of the RPG had sold over 200,000 copies in Japan, according to Kadokawa. The latest 7th edition of the game was released in December 2019, featuring a complete overhaul of the rulebook. 
Role-playing game writer and editor Masayuki Sakamoto has worked on Call of Cthulhu since its original release in Japan. And they told Dicebreaker that the 6th and 7th editions have sold more than 300,000 copies combined, including 60,000 copies of the latest edition. When we reached out to the Call of Cthulhu studio Chaosium, a representative told Dicebreaker that the Japanese language release of the RPG doesn't just outsell any other language, it sells more copies than all of the other games' languages combined, English included. Another massive difference between the English language and Japanese TTRPG markets is that, according to the game's production studio Arclight, most Call of Cthulhu players in Japan are women aged between 17 and 35. In comparison, Wizards of the Coast revealed last year that more than three-fifths of D&D players identify as male, which is a lot of a difference. I mean, take a look at this photo from Yellow Submarine, the biggest RPG store in Japan, where the Call of Cthulhu book section is the same size as all other RPG sections combined. As Chaosium themselves put it, whereas role-playing game is synonymous with Dungeons and Dragons in many other countries, in Japan, role-playing game equals Call of Cthulhu. So how did this relatively niche survival horror RPG top of the giant dragon on the RPG hill? Well, one thing that massively helped is a little something that looks like this. Let's start the call of Tolhu RPG. The theme of this session is Adventure in the World of the 1920s. Enjoy the adventure in the world of the 1920s. Yeah. The first stage is the US in the 1920s. It was called Roaring Twenties Jazz Age Prohibition Era. The US was excited at the special demand of World War I. The era in which the American economy prospered unprecedentedly and the lifestyle of mass production and mass consumption was established. Exactly. Okay, what the hell did you just watch? Uh, this is a Call of Cthulhu replay. Specifically, this is one that's been translated from Japanese to English, and you can watch the rest using the link in the description below. Replays differ from the more common tradition of actual plays that English-speaking audience are used to, in the vein of things like Critical Role and The Adventure Zone, in that instead of recording their session on video or audio and releasing as is, replays are instead sort of dramatised versions of play sessions that have been lifted from transcripts of the playthrough. Instead of recording a session and have the players effectively sit as actors in the story like we're used to, Japanese replays instead use a combination of Vocaloid or text-to-speech programs and dating sim engines. I'm sure by now you're pretty familiar with a text-to-speech engine, in fact. What is text-to-speech? Here's the definition of text-to-speech. Technology that enables text to be converted into speech sounds imitative of the human voice. Well, I mean, I couldn't put it better myself. This speech generation tool, combined with scenes generated by modded versions of dating sim games, in which you can have characters pop up when they're speaking against backdrops, floating music that fits a theme maybe, it gives a pretty engaging way to watch people roleplay without having to rely on microphones, cameras, sets, or even just having to be on camera for any players who aren't as comfortable with performing. These factors make these replays easy to put out and easy to watch, especially in a market where consumers are already way more used to the idea of virtual personas, like Hatsune Miku or VTubers on streaming platforms. These replays were already a pretty common thing before their video adaption as well, as they were a great way of giving examples of how the game flows and functions when it's running. It's pretty common for a game to come with a written transcript of a game played when purchased. The players can then read through and get to grips with the rules and the setting. But that's not the only thing that has pushed Call of Cthulhu to such great heights in Japan. Up until around 2010, the 6th edition of the game had only sold about 10,000 copies, according to Masayuki Sakamoto, who I mentioned earlier has been working on Cthulhu since its original release in Japan. In 2012, the Cthulhu Mythos name became popular among young people through the anime Nioruko Crawling With Love, and many replay videos were uploaded to Niko Niku, which is a, a video sharing website, around the same time attracting many people's attention. Horror fits well with web content. It's fun to watch, the player gets scared and surprised. The same goes for console video games, where horror games are very popular. When it comes to the reach of Dungeons & Dragons in Japan, I mean, there was a time when the dungeon crawling RPG that we all know was dominating the Japanese market, just like we said. In 1985, when its basic set was first translated. 
According to Sakamoto, though, the transition to advanced Dungeons & Dragons did not go well, which was then followed by a discontinuation of the Japanese edition, following its move to current publisher Wizards of the Coast in 1997. A third edition released in 2002, which seemed to sell as well, or even slightly better than its competitor Call of Cthulhu, but whilst sales of D&D books seemed to be steady, Call of Cthulhu's rise in popularity was almost meteoric. It's also worth noting that Japan has its own thriving TTRPG scene as well. While Call of Cthulhu is the most popular RPG from outside Japan, the best-selling tabletop RPG developed locally is Sword World, a fantasy game first released in 1989 that has sold hundreds of thousands of copies across multiple editions. With a high fantasy RPG that's widely available and made directly in Japan available on the market, translations of D&D might not seem quite as appealing. So it seems that D&D isn't perhaps quite as ubiquitous as we once thought, which, as far as I'm concerned, is great. I love that other RPGs in the world are taking a bit more of the limelight, and even if you're a D&D diehard, a little competition never hurt anyone. Well, thanks so much for watching this little deep dive into the Japanese RPG market here on Dicebreaker. If you haven't already, please do hit subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified whenever we put a new video live. We also now have a membership program called Dicebreaker Plus that allows you to see exclusive new videos every month and you can sign up by hitting the join button below. This video was adapted from an article by our editor-in-chief Matt Jarvis over on Dicebreaker.com, a link to which is in the description below. Be sure to head over and find out more about Call of Cthulhu's reign in Japan, as well as a massive amount of articles about everything tabletop related, from news, reviews, interviews, and more. Most importantly though, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and until I see you next, have a lovely day.